Hello, everyone who is online. Uh, welcome back. So uh, I'm Gail Forge, and um, I'm going to present this one now. The hands-on session on simulating organic pathways um, for uh, marine litter, pollutants, and, and marine ecosystems. I have a few slides to start, uh, and then I'm going to show you some, um, some notebooks. Um, right. um, all right, so I'm going to tell you about um, methods in Julia that we have already developed um, to simulate pathways uh, of various um, materials and, and um, quantities in the ocean. Um, they're also applicable to the atmosphere. So maybe my, my title is a bit uh, too narrow in a sense, but I'm going to focus on the ocean applications. And um, why this is relevant to a meeting on Earth observation? Well, partly because of what I was describing yesterday, and also because generally speaking, um, anything in the ocean or the atmosphere has to be viewed as you know um, life within the fluid in movement. So you, you have to account for that. Uh, um, that element, even if you're looking at satellite data, for example, there is underneath moving matter. Just here, I'm going to give you uh, this uh, little bit of background on uh, ocean circulation and transport uh, processes um, briefly, because the audience is not um, necessarily accustomed to uh, the, the topic. Um, and then I will get into the notebooks. Um, so here are some, uh, some references, uh, if you want to know more about um, these problems, um, I have made a very um, um, opinionated selection amongst things that I'm involved with. Um, there's a lot of um, science um, in climate and oceanography that has to do with transport processes uh, from the global scale. Uh, so this first paper that I highlighted here is about um, uh, ocean heat transport and makes the case that uh, the way that it's normally defined is, a, is rather sensitive to a, um, a reference temperature and that we have a better way now to, uh, to handle that or something that's less sensitive mm -hmm. to uh, these arbitrary parameters. Uh, the second one is, is closer to what I'm going to show you today. Uh, it's about uh, simulating the so-called um, Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, often also um, termed the uh, conveyor belt or, uh, um, yeah, um, looking at it from the perspective of, of pathways. And so this is work that uh, Louise Rousselet and Paula Chessy did with me, uh, where they did, uh, Louise specifically, um, simulations of, of, of trajectories over thousands of years. Um, using Fortran in this case. The third one is uh, the closest to the topic today. Uh, this is work in collaboration with um, the colleagues at um, the Ocean Cleanup Project. Um, Alexandre Petavin uh, was the lead author. And so he did a data simulation exercise showing that we can use concentration data for marine litter or plastics, um, debris and stuff um, into a dispersion model. And so finally, the last two are Julia packages that um, have been developed by myself and colleagues, uh, specifically Jean Wu uh, for the second one. The individual displacements package is one that really is focused solely on, on simulating pathways. Um, and uh, that's what I'm going to illustrate today. Uh, Plankton individuals is a agent-based model uh, that focuses a little more on the representation of um, marine life. So what does that look like in practice? Um, this is from uh, Louise Rousselet's work. Um, I think it was a schematic that was in, the, in one of the papers. Um, you're looking at this uh, so-called conveyor belt structure. And you see this is a plot uh, as a function of depth and latitude um, over the globe. Um, so this is sort of the three-dimensional uh, ocean circulation, once, once you sort of uh, collapse 
um, the longitude dimension. And so this is one of the key aspects of ocean circulation for climate. It's not exactly what I'm going to focus on, but I will draw your attention to the so-called subtypical cells in the upper ocean. These are the ones that we're going to be talking about. So we're going to be less concerned today with the, the deeper stuff, the longer time scales, and focus more on the near surface. Um, another view on this from above, um, this is now, if you're looking at the gray contours and the black contours, these are the so-called ocean gyres. Um, so you see, for example, that um, in the Atlantic, you have uh, this dark contour that corresponds to the Gulf Stream. And I'm going to tell you briefly what the colored contours are, but don't worry about them now. Um, and so this is sort of the, the circulation in the ocean that comes from, say, the Gulf Stream bringing waters to the Azores. Uh, and then circling back through the Gulf of Mexico and so on. So there's a lot of, lot of these features in the ocean. Um, a massive one that you see in the, in the southern part of the domain is this so-called Antarctic circumpolar current. Um, the colored contours, as a side note, is the divergent term. So this corresponds to the flux of heat um, from typically from the tropics to the subtropics. Um, won't talk too much about this today, but there's one notebook that does that for you in Julia, in, in Julia now. This decomposition essentially of ocean heat transport or ocean transport into these divergent and, and, and rotational components. If you kind of have a, a memory imprint of what you just looked at, um, this is another view of this sort of horizontal circulation. Um, you're looking at 300 meter depth, where I have seeded in a flow field, uh, a bunch of particles that we then, oh, thank you, uh, uh, that we then track as a function of time following the current. So this is exactly what we're going to be doing in the, um, in the notebook and the application in a minute. Um, I wanted to drive your attention to the fact that this resembles the previous map because we are kind of a little bit below the surface. But when we go way up, things look quite different. Um, and so that's the point I was trying to drive home. This is the sort of the view you would get from following the fluid uh, in the near surface layers. And so these are the ones where the vast majority of marine life takes place. This is also where the plastics that is floating material uh, will get stuck to a large degree. And so that's the one we're going to focus on, just following um, water that we are going to assume is floating near the surface um, along this circulation. And I've highlighted on, this, on the left here the fact that you see those trajectories sort of collapse or converge to a certain latitude. Um, this has to do with um, ultimately the wind-driven circulation. Uh, and so that means that you have the flow field sort of converging and bringing all of these um, plastics to a particular point. So that's the origin ultimately of the great plastic patches as they are uh, often called. Um, in this simulation that we will do, um, there will be even too much convergence for reasons that have to do with simplifications. Uh, but this is sort of the, the broad view of, of the problem. It's like we put plastic in the ocean, it's going to circulate around, and it's going to tend to converge in particular regions that happen to be a little south of where we are, um, around 20, 30 degrees of latitude. Right. Um, I lost my water bottle somehow. Uh, so uh, it's okay. Um, so coming to Julia now, this is uh, an excerpt from the documentation of the individual displacements package um, to give you the flavor of um, how you operate it. Uh, so it's a high level API, uh, which involves a little bit of, of Unicode to make things um, easily interpretable. <laughs> oh, great, thank you. Um, 
And um, so the way that this works out is uh, we put together a data structure that contains the flow field specification. That's going to be the ocean circulation that the, uh, the Lagrangian particles are going to be exposed to and following. Then we define the initial positions of uh, these individuals or particles that might be um, a concentration of plastic that could be also a patch of the marine ecosystem uh, that each of the particles represents. And then we're going to, to call in number three, this um, integrating functions uh, over some time. So you see it's written a little bit like you would do in, uh, in math uh, on purpose. Um, once the simulation takes place and after it has taken place, we can then uh, post-process the output uh, from the differential equation solver that I'm going to use. And we can make more diagnostics, such as uh, sampling from gridded variables, uh, say temperature. We want to know how, um, how, for example, a patch of plankton, plankton is going through um, different temperature ranges that affects them uh, in their in their survival and their and their growth, um, and so this is number four. And step four is uh, sorry. Step five is basically go back to uh, number three and keep well, number two and keep going. Um, so we can do this uh, over millennia or over very short time scales. Um, and I'm going to show you now a few examples. After I take a quick drink of water. Any questions thus far? All good? Okay. So this was the uh, ocean transport primer. Let's put it this way. And now I'm going to go to the actual hands-on part. So I am here in our Docker environment, um, a container, as we call it. Um, and I have already opened my notebooks. Now, one of the issues we are going to potentially have is with data inputs in one of the notebook. Um, so I have provided them here to the people in the room on the USB drive, uh, this file here called echo.tar and this file called grid.tar. Um, for the folks online, you should not have to read about those uh, because the notebooks are going to download them automatically for you. We are just here in an issue that, in a situation that's a little different because we have a few people, a lot of people in the room and we don't want everybody to download at the same time uh, from the Wi-Fi, which, um, uh, which would saturate. So with this said, I've already pre-opened all of the notebook to um, make this a little easier on us. And I'm going through a few different um, cases. Let me briefly show you this notebook that I will go back to later on in the afternoon. This is to depict again, the ocean circulation estimate that we are going to use. These are what are called reanalysis products or model data synthesis. Um, the ECHO project is one that is uh, dear to my heart uh, because I've, I've been a long-term participant in this, um, in this effort. Uh, it's led by NASA um, and these days by NASA GPL specifically. Um, you will find here a lot of um, things that might look familiar from my presentations before in the week and a lot of very useful information. So please follow us and, and um, consider using our products. Um, you will find also, since I'm here, I'm going to show you a little web page that describes the kind of analysis tools that we have created. Uh, we have things to analyze our model output uh, and our solutions in various languages, including this one that you heard about this week called Julia. Uh, so we have this nice um, um, 
story map, as it is called, um, that you can explore later at your convenience um, that will tell you a lot more about um, this project and how to use it in Julia and so on. Um, I'm not going to spend too much more time on this, but Echo is this project. Um, this is the notebook that lets you explore it interactively. Um, you will find it um, on the um, on the Docker image, as well as on the Julia Clamet notebooks web page, uh, which I will remind you is here. So this is the web page that is uh, found on the Julia Climate Organization um, and slash notebooks. Um, okay. It has a long list of uh, notebooks in it. This is what also we are using for the Docker image that, um, that will be maintained moving forward. Um, the notebook in question is called Echo Standard Plots. And all I'm going to show you from this at this point is this view of the horizontal circulation uh, from above, integrated top to bottom as before, and highlight to you that there is a lot more in this um, in this notebook for you to look at. Um, so, for example, this uh, so-called uh, conveyor belt or overturning circulation. Here's one view of it. Um, I've mentioned also. Ocean heat transport, so this is that. Um, we have various transports across um, different regions. Uh, so this is, for example, uh, this Antarctic circumpolar current. Uh, probably somewhere have, uh, let's see. Yeah, there's the Davis Strait. You know, a lot of the different gates in the ocean that separate ocean basins um, and, so, and so on and so forth. So this is a one notebook that uh, you can um, look at. We will maybe take another look this afternoon at this one. Uh, so this is the sort of timing, so-called Eulerian view of the problem, where you're just looking at map on the gridded, on the gridded plane. Uh, but what we want to do today is slightly different. And we are going to do um, two or three notebooks um, that have to do with this Lagrangian point of view, where we are going to, instead of just looking at a gridded field, we're going to put particles in it and we're going to follow them. Um, so when you look at weather forecast on, um, on TV, uh, you have similar views sometimes of you know, the, the wind fields in this kind of dynamic motion. So that's what we're going to do. Um, maybe I should take a little break, ask if there's any questions or comments, concerns. Everybody's happy? Good. So um, we're going to start with sort of the simplest thing you can think of, but that's quite relevant, uh, which is this random work problem in a plain view. So this is something that a lot of people would use in their examples when they talk about this because it's extremely simply simple to code. Everything that all that we do is we take a original point and at every time step, we move that in a random direction by I think one, uh, in this case, just one uh, value, but it's randomly going in one or the other direction. So by the end of the simulation, you're going to see a pathway like this, which has started at 0, 0, .0 somewhere uh, here in the middle. And then let me try and rerun that to make sure it's live. Huh. Oh, there we go. Um, and so that's what this notebook does. It's very lightweight. So that's a good, um, a good start also. I'm going to mention the packages that it uses, which uh, Uh, how do I put those? Huh. 
Well, there we go. Um, that's the difficulty with hiding stuff from myself. Um, so in this notebook, we're using three things. We're using, um, first of all, it's a Pluto notebook. Uh, we're using Pluto UI for the interactivity and, and reactivity part. Um, Carol Mackie for uh, the plotting, and then this climate models that JL package that I created and, and presented at um, Julia Kern a couple of years ago. Um, what climate models that JL is, it's a driver of ultimately models that are relevant to climate or oceanography or atmospheric science, uh, models that can be of any nature, um, written in any language in principle, um, at least any language that we are able to use on a, on a Linux machine. So it provides a few functionalities that I'm going to highlight. Um, and it's presented in my, in my July con talk last year. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to tell you about the random work process itself. So the random work is we initialize points, a point at zero, zero. And then, like I said, we just write a loop uh, that's going to randomly add plus one or minus one in the two directions. And that's it. Uh, so it's super simple. It's a loop that has a function of time steps here, NS uh, in this case. And we can change NS to something else. Uh, we will do that in a second. I am um, then, like I said, leveraging this climate model.jl for a couple of different things, but here I'm also using it to avoid having to reload a couple of packages that are already included in climate models.jl, so data frames in particular, and CSV. So this is the post-processing of the output. We are getting the time series of the positions, putting that in a data frame, and then outputting to a CSV file, right? So then the plotting reloads this file and, and just displays. Okay, so I'm going to do a quick change of this number of time step. So this is a hundred time step, as you see, well, there's only so far you can go away from your origin point if you do 100 steps. If we go to say 1,000, all of a sudden the map expands. Let's keep going. This is 10,000. And maybe I'm not going to do 100,000 right now because you will have to wait, um, but this uh, should scale up quite, uh, quite easily. It's a simple algorithm. And so if we just rerun this, you see that um, you end up in different places every time. If you were to do this many, many times, you would see some sort of pattern emerge, um, but that's not the topic of the day. I'm just going to reduce this one tiny bit, make a thousand. No, I like 10,000. Okay. What else did I want to say about this? Um, yes, the climate models that gel interface. So, this is a common interface to run models of different kinds. And what it does for you is it sort of packages this model run in a, um, a reproducible framework. So it starts by creating a little folder for you where everything gets copied and takes place, which also has a, a Git enabled subfolder to keep track of the different operations in this, in this, um, in this sequence. So this is a very simple model. Uh, it has here, this is the a view inside of the, the folder that it's run into. You can just access that from the data structure of the climate model. In this case, it's a Lagrangian simulation, but uh, so you see here that it has the CSV file. And then if I do, this I think should work. This is the Git enabled subfolder. And so the point of this subfolder is that I put the environment in there. Um, and I also keep track of any change that's made to those files. So the point is that at the end of this, you should have in one folder, the history of what you've done and that 
enables you to reproduce the computation later, setting aside the randomness of this particular computation. So there we go. And so what this um, package enables us to do is that once you have, looking for my code here, let me put this. Uh, uh -huh. Once you have uh, formulated this, this data structure, basically you set it up and then you call run on it and everything else happens in the background, creating the subfolders, running the thing and, and, and so on. Um, it also attaches to each computation a unique identifier so you can distinguish between different model simulations later on. So this is something I created for myself to kind of embed my various workflows and uh, it's composable. Um, so it's part of my digital twin framework, essentially. Um, any questions on climatemodels.jl or comments? Please do not hesitate to interrupt. This is a hands-on, so no questions. So that means either that I'm completely unclear or that everything is transparent. Which is it? <laughs> Go ahead. I, I'm unsure why you included climate models in this demo. Uh, can you explain a little bit more? Yep, thank you. Um, yeah, so I included this in the demo because I guess two reasons. Uh, one is was a good opportunity to, uh, to describe it um, and to explain that it's a general framework that uh, can be used for the rest of, of what I'm doing. Um, and the other sort of simpler answer is that it was like that in the notebook that I already had. So I'm reusing a notebook that had that in it. Um, and uh, it's in fact, one of the examples of the climate models that GL documentation that we're looking at. Yeah, cool. Any other question? No, okay. Then we're going to go back to the ocean transport problem per se. Uh, and I can hide this, uh, no. So this is a notebook that you should be able to rerun without data. Uh, has anybody tried? Uh, yeah, it works. Excellent. Um, so we already seen that uh, you can change the uh, the number of time steps. Um, so I don't need to say much more about this. If you rerun this cell, right, which we can do in this Pluto notebook with this button, you will see new instances. And so. If you run a lot of these, what you will find is that uh, the distance that you reach um, over a number of random time steps um, sort of converges on average. Um, it relates to, um, or it's often related or expressed in terms of a diffusion rate, um, which is a little interesting in itself. Um, and so typically these things kind of spread out as a Gaussian if it's just completely random. If you imagine that you would have a ocean current uh, that would move stuff around, then you would see something different, which would be much more, um, which have a much clearer direction uh, to it on the average. Oops, so I just want to rerun this one more. All right, so you can do this a million times and you know generate new examples every time. Um, and then I'm going to close on this one after just showing you the log of the Git subfolder. So here we see that we have done the initial setup. I've backed out the parameters of the model in this subfolder and then the project.toml, the manifest.toml, and so on. Um, so that's the Git functionality. All right, now. Next one. So. Next one, we are going to do uh, the global ocean circulation problem that I had announced at the beginning. But before I go there, I'm going to show this one. So this is a different way of doing this. Um, and in fact, this example is 1D as opposed to 2D. And it's meant to 
uh, illustrate um, something slightly different. This is um, from this paper, yeah, that I've cited. What we do in this problem, so if you look on the left-hand side, uh, you have the initial condition and then what it converges to. And then on the right-hand side is the result that comes from this um, so-called Lagrangian particle tracking simulation. I'm going to explain why there is two different panels. Uh, but basically we start from a configuration over this axis here uh, the horizontal axis, which you th should think really as the vertical axis, probably, uh, because it represents the ocean mix layer. So we're already talking about the vertical processes, although I plotted it the other way around. Um, so the idea is we start from a situation where we have two layers and that are very distinct and completely homogeneous. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Excellent question. Thank you for that. Uh, in fact, it's hard to find. Um, uh, see if I can find it myself. Uh, so this one, if you go to my GitHub profile, uh, so this is github.com slash Gail Forger, and you scroll down, you're going to find a bunch of different organizations. So one of them is going to lead you to the Julia Ocean organization. Within Julia Ocean, which I will describe a little bit later, you will find this notebook. So this is now github.com slash Julia Ocean. This notebook is hidden a little further because it's a package that's in the early development stage. So to find it, you go in repositories and then you scroll down a bit and you're going to find something called oceandistributions.gl. All right, so this is now github.com slash juliaocean slash distributions.gl. If you go in the examples folder, there it is. Uh, so it's something called one dim diffusion.gl. Um, anybody has managed to find it? Yeah. So I'll remind you, this is you go to github.com slash juliaocean slash ocean distributions.jl and then examples. You will find this file called one dim for one dimensional diffusion. Good. Sorry for that. I should have put it in the notebook folder in the first place. I just was a little late on doing that. Do you find it? Cool. Okie dokie. So now I'm back to this page, uh, which is the notebook uh, that's running in the container. It's using three packages. Um, for some reason, I decided to use Unicode plots in this case. I don't know why. Um, could have used Mackie, that probably would have been more interesting. Uh, Unicode plots is for those who have not used it, it's a little package uh, that lets you display graphics within the terminal window, which is kind of nice because um, it doesn't require any other sort of library or at least not an external pop-up window. More importantly, um, statistics is just going to probably do a mean and stochastic DFQ. So, Stochastic DFQ is one of the packages from the SciML organization on GitHub. So if I go there, I think I'm going to find this one. Yes, um, which I don't think we've mentioned a ton uh, so far, um, but there is a very, very strong um, differential equation based framework uh, which um, is originally developed by this person, Chris Rocas, uh, but has a lot of contributors and a lot of uh, very good stuff. You also see some of our colleagues that are here. Um, and it is 
now a kind of a broadly um, applicable framework. Um, I use often ordinary differential equations. This is what we'll use, in fact, in the next notebook. Uh, but in this case, I'm using a stochastic ODE solver from, uh, from them. So this means that we, don't, we won't need to recode um, the random work like, like we did, for example. Uh, this would be a, um, another way to do it. Um, but I wanted to take advantage of the, um, the differential equation packages, which will also give me a nice segue to the next problem where I'm going to use it as well. All right. So there's going to be two models. There's going to be the so-called Eulerian models, Eulerian model, sorry, where uh, what you're going to see here is a little diffusion equation. And that is what leads to the left-hand side plot here. So if you just start from this sort of uh, step function and you apply a diffusion operator on it over time, it's going to smooth the contrast contrast between the left and the right. Uh, this is the same processes of diffusion that um, you will experience pretty much anywhere. Um, and that is, um, that is happening anytime there is a kind of a turbulent fluid um, or even other processes. And so essentially what happens is over time, this kind of step function sort of uh, flattens. Uh, by just virtue of, of a simply integrating uh, this Eulerian model, which if you look at what I'm doing here is just taking a, uh, a finite difference um, over a grid and then integrating that over time. And the ratio is just plotting and then, you know, uh, just of a time step. So this is the sort of modeling we do on a grid as opposed to the Lagrangian modeling framework where we need to follow particles. And so this here now is the one that uses the stochastic differential equation solver through this function. I need to remind myself what I did there. Um, but yeah, I think I have a, a condition such that with this, here, I'm preventing the particles that we're going to randomly move around from exiting the domain. And importantly, there is a second term in the equation that I'm going to tell you about in just one second, this one. So the main loop now, temporal loop of integration is here in this function. It goes over a number of time steps. It solves for the pathways of a bunch of particles over time through the differential equation solver. It applies this little um, Bondi condition, if you want to call it that, to keep stuff inside. Yes. And there is two sets of particles in this case. So the way that this is set up is instead of working on the grid, like we did before here on the left-hand side, we have the same initial conditions, but it's formulated differently. So it's formulated by having one set of particles with a certain um, property of one uh, that are going to be evenly distributed in this range of the x-axis. And similarly, on the left, we have uh, a bunch of little particles that all have a value of zero, and they are randomly distributed over this layer. So we start from these two pools of, of, um, of particles. Um, so what makes the step function now is the fact that they have constant values in each group. And that's where the other term comes in. So we are starting to move them around, and I'm going to remove this and see what that does for me. I should have done that beforehand. <laughs> oh, 
Okay, you see that the results has changed a little bit. Uh, and this is based on the um, on the averaging of um, of position. So now we are taking these two groups of particles. We have moved them around randomly in the range from zero to uh, I mean here it's one to ten. Um, and if you take for each little part of this, the average of what you find there, you're going to find a bunch of zeros and a bunch of ones. Right, the zeros are still kind of staying on the left, and the ones still staying on the right a bit, such that we have this kind of gradient. Um, but it is in fact rather different and wider than what you're going to see next when I had when I add this second term. So what this second term does, and that's the point of the paper I was citing at the beginning. It represents, I mean, I'm going to just wait for it to finish. There we go. Uh, so now this has collapsed, right? And this is, I believe, oh, I kind of messed up my plot, I think. Um, this is kind of more lined up with the what, what's on the left. Um, so what's happening now is anytime we have a collection of particles that are at the same depth level or the same point on the x-axis, we mix their properties a bit. So instead of them staying at zero or one, we kind of average out um, and we change their properties. And so this represents um, mixing um, at the micro scale. And so the idea here is you need to include this term and let particles that are near one another sort of interact with each other a little bit. So that's what we've added. We've added interactions between the particles. And so this is what this term does. And what else should I say about this? Not that much. Um, the point was really to illustrate uh, that instead of using my quick little simple random loop for my simple case, you can do a lot more with this by relying on um, stochastic uh, ODE solvers, for example, that have a lot more processes represented in them and a lot more options. And this is one of the ways that we can simulate in a continuous way um, the stochastic parts of fluid dynamics. Any questions or comments about this example? I went maybe a little fast. No, was that maybe unclear? Um, so you can then, you know, you can, you should be able to run this uh, this notebook without uh, without input again. Um, and so far, we have done two very simple cases that both have to do with uh, random movements in the ocean, or in the atmosphere, or in any fluids, really, uh, that are going to tend to spread out materials. So in the ocean, for example, if you have, thinking again about the plastic problem, if you put a bunch of plastic here, right, and you have random flow fields, they're going to tend to distribute out. We are going to now look at the other part of the problem, which is the more um, predictable component, which is that if you have a bunch of plastic and you put it in an ocean current like the Gulf Stream, it's going to go east well, right? And so the mix of those two things is ultimately a good way to understand what's going on with that um, marine meter problem and, and this issue we have with the great garbage patch. There is a vertical component. There's other things having to do with the fact that unfortunately fish eats uh, all of this microplastic. Um, there is also evidence nowadays that uh, a bunch of the plastic gets stuck, not at the surface, but somewhat below. Um, and they also interact with um, the biomass itself. So if you have particulate matter that's falling down because biomass is, is dying or is, it's, it's, it's Excrements, are, excrements are, are falling to the seafloor. That might aggregate a bunch of the plastic and bring it down to the seafloor. 
so there's all sorts of processes that are quite interesting and, and in fact, um, still require a fair amount of research that I'm going to overlook here. Uh, but a good starting point is to think of the marine litter problem, or in fact, the marine ecosystem uh, displacement problem as a combination of those two terms that are both horizontal. One is going to have a, a predictable um, non-stochastic component, which is following the flow fields. And the other is going to be this sort of stochasticity that's going to tend to expel and redistribute um, the materials over space. So now with all of this uh, introduction and, and setup and having done the stochastic problems, we're going to look at this, which is what I announced in the first place. I'll take another little break here to give you an opportunity to ask questions or, or make comments or whichever. Anyone? Maybe I go back to the previous notebook before I, before I change. Anybody has had success with this one or more uh, question about this, um, this particular example? Oh, I'm sorry for that. Um, is it because your your Wi-Fi is completely out? Yeah, I'm connected and then I'm oh. out and then I connect. <laughs> no, that's unfortunate. I, hopefully, you will be able to. Uh, So this notebook ultimately should not require Wi-Fi. Uh, once you have just downloaded the, the text file, if you have Julia on your machine, you can also run it that way, right? So maybe I'll show that actually. Okay. Um, so let me download this notebook. Um, well, actually this gives me an opportunity to talk a little more about Pluto, which has some very nice features. We've already uh, seen that you just have to plug in the file name. I want to show you this piece, which is quite interesting, um, quite useful to me very often. Uh, so there is an export function. If you're here at the top, right? You click on this triangle and this circle, gives you the export function. The export function lets you do HTML, which here would be the end result of that. It lets you export, excuse me, the Jula file as well, which you can equivalently get from the website. All right, so that's the, that's the file, that's the notebook, the whole notebook in terms of code. So you can take that and then we're going to do uh, and you can do this with other editors. I kind of like VI myself. Um, okay. So what you just saw happen here, in fact, is sort of interesting as well, right? There's a lot of code, but there's very little that is in fact code you're using directly. So let me point that out once more. Um, this is the structure of a Pluto notebook uh, in its native code form. Um, at the beginning, you recognize some of the codes we had, but very soon, once you go forward, you're going to get to this point where where here you find this specification of the dependencies. And so this is stating that this notebook uses the statistics package, the stochastic DFQ package, and this Unicode plots thing. 
And everything after that, which is the great majority of the notebook, in fact, is the dependencies of the dependencies. So in this case, in particular, I'm going to assume that the vast majority of them come from this stochastic DFQ package. And it is because we have all of this included in the notebook that we are able to rerun it by just showing a file. Last thing I will point is, so there was 1,283 lines. Oops. Here we are at line number 220. So there's in fact only 200 lines in this code, in this notebook, most of which are markdown comments, like you see just at the top here. This is one of the markdown cells. Uh, and then there is uh, everything else, which is the, the, the 12,000 lines, if I got this right. Sorry, the 1,200 lines. Uh, so 1,000 of this is just the dependencies, this you know, documentation. And at the very end, there's one more thing to point out, which is the ordering of the cells. So as you might have noticed, sometimes I put my package dependencies at the end of the notebook because that's not what you want to present to the audience first, right? You can do this in Pluto easily because it keeps track of the ordering of the cells for running the code and for displaying it. Uh, so this is the order of the cells for displaying it. And otherwise, the code itself here, I went back to the top, uh, is ordered in the proper way for just running the file. So I'm going to do Julia. Let me do something. I'm trying to wonder how, I'm, how am I going to get me in, myself in trouble there? here. So let's see if I can anticipate that. Um, this is going to pre-install the package that they haven't installed yet. Uh, so that in fact might be difficult if you don't have Wi-Fi again. Uh, but when you do the using command with the more modern versions of Julia, it lets you know when it needs to install something for you. And so here, I'm doing this on my laptop now. Uh, I didn't have the stochastic DFQ package, and so it's going to do that for me. It's going to install all of the sub-dependencies that I didn't have already. And um, yeah, I guess it's since we had not really insisted on that during the week, I think it's useful to go to it, um, even though it's a bit off topic from, the, from this session. Um, this is, in a sense, what's happening in the background when you run a Pluto notebook as well. It does that all of it in the background without you having to worry about it. But that is why there is a delay sometimes in the notebook starting, is if you didn't have those packages already in place, you need to get them, right? And so here, there we go. I think I now have probably everything I need. It's going to then pre-compile the packages. Um, there we go. And then we're going to be able to run the model. So include is just to include the Julia file. And it's going to run all of the comments that I showed you, the 200 lines at the top of the file. And hopefully, uh, I didn't forget anything else, and it will complete nicely. Um, I'll go back for one second to the web browser. So now here I am back in my uh, original notebook that's running in the container. I just wanted to grab this, which is going to let me do the display in the terminal. There we go. So it's completed. All right, I'm back to my terminal window. And let's see if that works. There we go. So this is the, I guess I have two more plots in there. Um, this is what I was telling you about the Unicode plots.gl package, which uses Unicode characters 
uh, encoding something. Uh, to make a quick little plot for you, um, and so it's not the high, you know, high definition type of plots you will want to put in your papers, right? Uh, but this is a very kind of use, useful and quick way uh, to operate anywhere that you can just have a terminal window, which in, in some cases is useful when you're on supercomputer or whatever. Uh, you might not want to be doing like displays because there are firewalls and, and so on. Uh, so it's a neat little option to have, um, and it can do heat maps as well. Um, there's a lot of nice functionalities. Um, and so here you sort of see the same result we saw before, right? With the three curves and the other one. Um, so I realized that I sort of launched the tangent uh, based upon your question, but I hope this was useful. Uh, yeah. Um, and yeah, it lets you know that if you want to take one of those um, Pluto notebooks and, and run it in a kind of standard Julia way. You start with the using commands to install your packages, right? And then you can just include the file and it runs for you. Any questions or comment on that? Include. Yeah. Yeah. You need the file there, and then you include and just the file name. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I was uh, the import is also something in Julia. So import is a way to say uh, import a package. So say I probably have CSV around. No. <laughs> so import is different from using. Mm -hmm. Using is kind of the more Julian way, which is going to export functions into your environment. Import is more the Python way originally, such that you're not going to have access to the functions that are embedded inside the package with providing at the beginning um, the package name, the, the function name, or the data structure name, or whatever, but it all stays inside. So this is kind of useful sometimes when you have um, different packages using the same function names and so on. You can get into conflicts if you export all of them. In fact, we've seen a couple of cases like this between the, I think the rasters package, was it? Or the meshes package and the Maki package that have kind of the same function names. Uh, so that's kind of a useful thing to, to know about, import versus using. And the other thing I'm going to show you here, because I don't think we've kind of covered that and it's useful for people who start, is the different package, man uh, package man uh, sorry, the different terminal modes. So if I go back in front of this line, all right, and I just hit question mark, now we are in the help prompt. And that's going to give you the help of the function. So this is something you can do for any function that has a doc string to access the help and the directions immediately, right? And gives you sometimes examples like this. But in this case, you need to create a data frame and so on and so forth. Another thing that I might highlight is this with the semicolon is the shell mode. So now you're back in your kind of use it, you know, standard Linux way of doing things, uh, you access your files. So for example, this would be looking that the file is here in, in Linux. Um, if you want to do this in Julia, so you, you go back to the beginning of the line and you type escape to go back to the normal mode. Maybe not, you know, so you, you delete, not escape. So now if I do that, that's not going to work for me. However, there's a Julia function that does sort of the same thing, which is going to be is file. So this is a way to do a lookup for a file on disk, the Julia way and the Linux way. One more, the package manager mode. So the backward square bracket. 
package. Here you're going to be able to see everything that you have installed. And you do that with the status shortcut ST. So here you're going to see that I'm using Jula 1.8, that I have started a lot of work in 2019, and it's not finished, um, that um, I have a lot of different packages in there, including the one that I've just installed. Right? Again, you get out of there by doing delete, and you're back to the normal terminal mode. So Julia is very fluid like that. You can, you know, within your terminal window, or you can do this also in the Jupyter notebook, in fact. Um, you can access different, different components of your, of your workflow, um, which I find is really nice. So uh, enough about the terminal mode, I think. Um, all this. Okay. Um, unless there's any question on this. Is that useful to remind people of this? This is kind of a, a, a little bit of the beginner session that we sort of maybe didn't spend enough time on. Um, and I guess another of my tangents. Um, okay. So finally, we're going to go to the global ocean circulation problem. And let me do something quick to see that it's running as I want it to run. Yeah. Okay. So. We are finally going to use my individual displacements.gel package, uh, which inside uses um, the differential equations package that I just demonstrated in the 1D case, but not stochastic. Um, so this notebook has um, this nice little table of content, table of content, which in Pluto is extremely simple to create. Uh, it's part of the Pluto UI.gl package. And you just put um, table of contents and I think parenthesis and you're, and you're done. Let's you navigate. Um, so I try to do that in, in all of my notebooks when I get it, when I think of it. Um, I have here just a plotting function. We don't need to look at that extensively. I want to find my packages, which are going to be you get the top. Oh no, next one. Okay. So the packages that we're going to use here. So individual displacements is the main computational engine for this. I'm going to use Karumaki for visualization, Pluto UI for the interactivity and the widgets and all of that. And then the last two. Ocean state estimation .gl is a package that I created to incorporate easily these um, NASA ocean circulation products that I was telling you about at the beginning. So ECHO, this um, estimating, estimating the circulation and climate of the ocean project generates files that can be a little hard to handle sometimes because of some of the um, uh, elaborate uh, grids that we use to solve for the ocean circulation problem uh, on the sphere. I mentioned that a little bit uh, in one of my earlier presentations. And MIT GCM tools is brought in also for the same reason of it's useful for the output that I'm, that I'm using. Um, but if you were to use, say, a, a simple light long grid flow field that you find somewhere, say from the satellites, um, from the same type of things, for example, that we were looking at with Andre the other day, uh, you can get, um, from the satellite, you can get flow fields for the sea surface. I'm simplifying. Uh, you could sort of 
you, you wouldn't need those two, essentially. So the three that are really more important to this presentation are those three. And this is a bit of you know, convenience code for making things easy for me. So now we proceed um, the way that I have announced it in the slides. Uh, we are going to set up the flow fields, which is here. So I have a little function to do that. It returns um, data structures that are going to be providing the flow fields. I think it's P. Has that in it? Yes. Um, so this has velocity fields at two time steps, zero and one for simplicity, but really they can be, I mean, they, this could be a, a month between the two. In fact, it is a month here. So this is say January and then February and two components because this is a 2D problem. So U and V uh, for uh, the two components that can be eastward, northward, but they can be whatever. And that's what this measure is package sort of allows you to do. And then there's going to be a function that uh, is embedded in there and a time period. So this, this time period here should correspond to a month if I'm not um, getting myself confused. And so this formatting of this data structure is the first step. That is what's going to allow the rest of it to follow in a, in a very simple way. Um, as you see here, it says F measure is 2D. Uh, and that's because I'm doing a 2D problem. And instead of using a regular grid um, flow field, I'm using this somewhat more advanced uh, way of doing things with measure rates. But there are other uh, variants of this. Uh, so there is a F, I think just array 2D, which is for a plain array the way you would most commonly use experience it. And there are 3D versions of both of those things. So depending on the example you look at in the documentation of individual displacements, you will be using one of those four. And we can do more uh, if there are other array types that we want to support. Uh, so that's the extendability of this package. Um, since I'm at this, I will also mention this other thing here. D, which I use to carry around ancillary variables. Um, so you don't have to worry too much about it. I'm mostly looking at it to remind myself what's in it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I have grid variables in there and I have, these are temperature fields. So these are actually kind of interesting. That's where you will carry around the extra variables you want to diagnose from the simulation later on. And the rest, you don't have to worry about too much. Um, a lot of this is just uh, bookkeeping. Um, this function is important because it's the one that's going to tell the program how to update the flow fields when I go from one month to another. Um, okay, this is that. I can get rid of this. Yeah. Oops, whatever. Um, and as you see here, it has a little bit of um, indication that this is this echo program that's generated the flow fields. There's a path that is interesting to notice. It's a technical detail, but there's a way that Julia lets you download files on the fly. There's even more than one. Uh, there's something called artifacts, and this is the scratch spaces approach. So what happens in the background when you run this notebook is, if it does not find the files, it downloads them automatically. If you are here today trying to run this notebook, that might get you in trouble because the download rates are slow. So sorry for that. Uh, you might have to go back to this notebook later on uh, to run it in a way that, that will be more convenient. Um, I pre-installed everything on my, uh, on my container uh, so that I could just demo it for you. The notebook itself is called, oh, it's not what I want. Uh, the notebook itself now you can find though here, if you go to, uh, 
to this notebook subfolder. And you go down to individual displacements. You're going to have the notebook right here. So this is the one that's called global underscore ocean underscore circulation dot gel. Um, the first example we did should be this one. Uh, so this is going back to actually now. This is a different case. Uh, so I have all of my examples from the package documentation here. And there's a three-dimensional case. There is a case that I call solid body rotation, um, which is a sort of a, what do you call that? A vortex type of model. So it's just something that rotates around and sinks. It represents a process in the ocean that's interesting, but I'm going to just skip over all of that. Um, and the rest is just glue code. Um, a lot of the notebooks that I've shown in previous um, sessions and, and after ones are in here. They have been installed directly in the container, in the image. So you should have them regardless of everything else if you download the Docker image. Now, back to this. I've done this part. I can remove this cell, which is kind of in my way. So in, in Pluto, again, you can delete a cell that you don't need. You can also disable them. At this point, we have defined the flow fields. This that you're seeing here, oops, sorry, is the next step. So once we have defined the flow field, we want to define the individual's data structure. So that's the one that's going to carry not just the flow field, but also the particles that we are then going to be tracking. Um, there's a little bit of Unicode here to make it uh, look funny. Um, I kind of like it, but we can, we can do without also. Um, and what you're seeing here is the display of this data structure. Uh, so this is just the visualization, a quick way to see what's in it. Um, so here we have 500 particles. This is the name of the um, solver ultimately. Uh, same here, and this is the post-processing function and again, this is my flow fields data structure. So once that is set up, so we've done the flow fields and then we've set up the individuals that we're going to move around with the flow field, then we can run. This is the model run. So here we specify the time, the, the time period, which I'm just grabbing from uh, this um, data structure that I had. And that is the command line to do the integration. So it has this bang um, symbol here to indicate that it's going to be mutating the data structure I. We have mentioned it, uh, Simon did in the beginner session. It's just a notation. It's not something strict, uh, but most people try to put the bang to indicate that something's going to get mutated by the function. Um, and this little integral is Unicode. Um, that's why I, I kind of like Unicode. It really speaks to what the function does. Underneath it, there is a function. So if I do this, I'm going to be able to show you that. I think these are the methods that are behind this and they are called, um, I guess they are called the same way. So there's three of them. This is the first integration. And then we're going to do a time loop on that. So there is in this package, um, in this example, I've sort of uh, rearranged this in this way. I've created a new function that's also mutating that updates the time period. This is what's going on here. 
replaces the flow fields that were for the time step zero and time step one, because we're entering a new time interval. So we need to replace those to the current month. Um, this is a good place to say that you can also do this backwards in time. Here we are doing forward in time. And then this little function is something I wrote uh, to randomly reset a bunch of the particles as I go. A very, very crude way of accounting for the fact that I don't have the stochastic term in, in there so that it doesn't completely collapse on, on, on the same points. Um, and then again, just the time integration. And in this case, I can omit the, the time period because I'm starting from the very beginning of the time interval. And so it's just going to do the whole time interval. This step function, this uh, step bank function, I can then put in a loop here. Uh, so this is the way that, um, a simple way to write a loop. Uh, it's a little abstract. You could, you could write it differently with you know, the four at the beginning and stuff in between. Um, but this is essentially the same thing. There's a number of years and a number of months. This little thing at the end is to add the longitude and latitude to the output so that we can visualize it. Um, and so that's the whole, the whole computation is those two lines, really this first line. Um, so that's where the power of sort of Julia data structure really comes in is it lets you write stuff in a way that's very condensed at the end because you're leveraging a lot of nature, native Julia features. This is the output uh, of this um, simulation. So it shows X, Y, uh, you don't have to worry about this um, component. And then temperature. I'm not sure why I don't see the longitude and latitude here. Should have that too. Yeah, yeah it does. So there's a couple of variables that are not displayed. That's probably just because my phone is, I don't know. I'm surprised it doesn't show them. But so in this, you have um, the identifier of each particle. You have the position in the grid space. This is just a, um, an index for the tile of the domain. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. So I'm going to Yes. So the question was whether I'm using kind of an annual mean climatology or a monthly mean climatology. The answer is I'm using a monthly mean. Correct. We are using exactly one, and then we do the climatology. You can do it that way. Yeah. It's just the way that you're going to reload the things. So. Indeed, we're using the monthly climatology here. So I'm going to use it in a, in a circular fashion. So that we're going to go January, February, December, and then back to January, the same as before. If you have a data set that has year-to-year -year variations, so a time series like you just mentioned of say 20 years of data, uh, where there is January 1992 in my case, and then all the way to December and then February, uh, January uh, 1993, et cetera, same principle. The only difference is, you know, the way you read the files. That's it. Yeah, um, exactly. Thank you for that. Um, time and then longitude and latitude. Uh, so this is my little data structure to store the output as I go for each month. I put stuff in the data frame so that now I have the whole time series at the end of that. And I can put everything in a nice CSV file. Ah, there we go. My <laughs> longitude and latitude are showing up now. Uh, and so the visualization at the end, um, I have a little function at the bottom that I can show you. Um, but mostly what you're seeing here is a short simulation. And so each of the red dots 
might have been the initial position and each of the stars is the final position. So over one month, we are doing, we've just computed the way that each one of those would have moved according to this climatological large-scale circulation. So each of the dots, if you think, can represent a bunch of plastic put in the ocean, right? And we're going to track it here in this case for just one month. Uh, and let me change this parameter. Which I think is maybe here. Nope. Um, so instead of doing that, which is this one twelfth of a year, I'm going to do two years. And I'm going to go back to the visualization. So this is still computing. And then it's going to show me the result. And remember how close the, um, the particles look like at this point, you see something slightly different next. Um, so this is the two year of computation and the, uh, and the whole sequence. That's taking a little, little while. There you go. You see what happened? Now there are the black stars, which are the final positions, now I'm sure, um, have collapsed a little bit uh, towards those lines that you see. Uh, and they would have collapsed even more if I had not sort of done this resampling of the domain. And so what is taking place here is that over those, that two year time period, um, the little patches of plastic have followed the ocean currents near the sea surface. And it so happens that near the sea surface, that flow field is convergent to certain regions. I've mentioned that in the slides at the beginning. And that is why the great plastic patches exist and the plastic tends to concentrate in certain regions. So if I go back and I do, oh, I didn't let myself put more than that, okay. Whatever. I'm just going to do a few less, show you an, another example. Um, so you can change the parameters and rerun this thing. Uh, this should scale fairly well, uh, depending on your memory. You can, you can do you know, 10,000 or whatever. Um, the ODE solver is really what, what brings the speed here, uh, aside from my having to read in files and, and so on, which can induce some latency. Uh, so there we go. Now we have a few, um, a few particles, but you sort of guess the same pattern. Um, you have questions on these simulations or on the? Sure. Uh, it's going to lag a little, maybe, but I will do that. They should be like those in the east should progress. More interior. I don't know. I'm just. It's possible. Uh, let me do. Uh, let me do that. Um, I'm also going to remove. Remove. Uh, sorry. Where did I put this? Right. I'm going to remove the, the thing that sort of resets particles at the beginning because it it kind of blurs the picture a bit. Um, I just need to remind myself where I've put this function uh, for stepping forward. Mm. Yeah, there we go. So I'm going to comment out this little thing here. I'll leave it open. And I'm going to go here. So as a side note, I'm going to make that the default. This way it will run it for me. Um, so this is going to be running now. Um, what you're looking at right here uh, on the screen is one of the markdown cells that is where all of the widgets above are included. That's one of the things that I love with, in fact, Mackie and Pluto uh, is you can define widgets very easily. So this is the one line that defines the button for the depth level. 
right? Because there is in fact a button for the depth level. This is the one line that lets you select, include a widget for selecting the duration of the run. And this is the one line that lets you select for the particles, the number of particles. Oops. Okay, I've done very few, so I'm going to do more. Because <laughs> I went back to 10, I'm going to do a longer calculation. And instead of putting 10, I'm going to go 1,000. Why not? So now I'm doing what you suggested, Andre. Um, I have increased the duration to four years. And I have increased the number of particles to 10,000. So I, I expect that we are indeed going to see um, more convergence of the particles in expectedly these specific latitudes that we have already noticed and sort of more towards the eastern part of the basin, which I think is what your question really was. Right? Um, so this is going to run a, maybe a, a few seconds because I increased the number of particles a bit and it's longer. Um, so all this runs, maybe I'll open it for another question or let you follow up. Anybody? Oh, there we go. See, fast. Um, yeah, so indeed, now that I have removed this kind of stochastic term that I arbitrarily introduced, uh, the flow fields being very laminar in this climatology, uh, things collapse very hard on those lines. And so this is the way that the, you know, the global plastic patch, garbage patch, might look like if there were no turbulence, oh, thank you, uh, if there were no turbulence in the ocean, right? That's the idea. Um, and so, yeah, there it is. I don't know why it's running a second time. Did I click twice? Maybe I clicked twice. Um, uh, that's unfortunate. Um, so I'm going to do something else since I'm here at this point. What do I have? Uh, I'm going to change the depth level. Because I have mentioned before, we are doing this at the sea surface or near the sea surface. Let me show you how things change when I go back to my 300 meter depth case that I was telling you about at the beginning. This is not going to be super interesting with the 10 particles here, but I will again change that to make it a lot more in a second. So what you are going to expect to see is that the particles are going to move at this 300 meter depth level, much more like the Gulf Stream that, uh, because now the influence of the winds are much less at that depth. Uh, the reason why the surface levels are so different and they converge so much is because the winds are creating this pattern and moving stuff near the sea surface towards um, <coughs> Towards certain latitudes. So let me go back and, and increase the number here. So again, where am I? Uh, let's do 500. Uh, so now we should see something that starts to resemble uh, the ocean circulation at that depth. Assuming I didn't, you know, make a mistake along the way. Um, any other question? Comments? Yep. Uh, are you, placing dots Hello. Uh, you place the dots randomly on the map, right? Yeah. But uh, in reality, the plastic could not be randomly placed. So yep. some of that. Uh, uh, the chunks of plastic in the middle of the ocean not exist because the initial place will not exist. Do you understand my idea? Yes, I do. Uh, so you're correct on that. Ooh. Okay, I'm getting myself in trouble. This is now the, of a much shorter of computation. Um, but yes, you're correct. So correct, and at the same time, it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, 
So what happens is if you wait long enough, regardless of where you put the particles, they basically end up in the same spot, more or less. And that's because everything is connected. Uh, they are, you know, I'm, I'm oversimplifying a little bit, uh, but if you wait long enough and you put something in the uh, Gulf Stream or a bit further from the Gulf Stream, you might end up in the same spot. That's going to still depend on the basins, right? So if you, if you put stuff next to Japan, it's not necessarily going to end up in the plastic patch of the Atlantic. It might end up in the Pacific, right? So that is for the sort of the long time, time scale. They are going to converge eventually. But you're completely right that, you know, the beginning of the simulation is very dependent on where you put the particles. And so when you want to go and study these problems and, and, and draw conclusions about the real world, right? The way that you would do this is you would not initialize stuff randomly, but you might put a plastic mass next to each river outflow, uh, river mouth, um, that would correspond to an estimate from, you know, um, from reality. Um, and if you do that, which is uh, what, you know, a lot of the projects like the Ocean Cleanup Project does, for example, um, then you start to, to really be able to talk to uh, who is responsible for the plastic and what their contributions are and have something more realistic. But it's a very good question. Thank you. All right, my uh, simulation here is just uh, too small. So I'm going to, <laughs> I don't know why it's doing this to me. All right, let me just, uh, doesn't want my default somehow. Actually, we'll do that. And I'm going to do four years. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so now I should be forcing it to do what I'm telling it to do. Um, and then go back here. I'd like to see my girl stream at some point. We'll see. Anything else? Any more questions? Comments? Okay. Um, so since I sit up the floor, I will, I will say that uh, we also have other frameworks in in the in the broad in the in the overall Juga software ecosystems uh, that huh. oh I see sorry every time I reinitialize the cell it sort of overrides my choices and it puts everything back to the defaults so this is level number four which is close to the C surface and I. All right, <laughs> I'm hoping to get there. Uh, I was saying that we do have other packages that lets you, for example, do Eulerian simulations. Uh, so you provide a flow field, and instead of advecting particles, you can do a tracer experiment, a tracer release experiment. Um, so that is this kind of passive transport framework. Um, some of this is in the Julia Ocean organization. There is also at this stage um, uh, a model called OceanAnigans.jl, which is developed by some of our colleagues at MIT, uh, funded through the PIMA program. Um, and that there's computation of the flow fields themselves. So if you want to model the ocean, one of the first things that you might want to do is simulate the ocean currents themselves, which I did not cover in this. Uh, we have a lot of climate models that do that. We have observations from the satellites that give us flow fields. We also have now Julia packages, uh, like Ocean and Egan's uh, .gl that um, can do that for you natively based on just an initial condition and a set of equations. Uh, in fact, Ocean and Egan's is a re-implementation, if you'd like in Julia, of the MIT general circulation model. And so they are sort of not um, they don't have quite the same features, uh, but they are two examples. I think this, oh no, I, saw, I thought you were raising your hands. No, it's okay. Um, so there's five minutes left. Um, um, any more questions? Maybe, I don't know if we're looking at online questions or... Um, so I did not manage to set up the computation I wanted to do. So this is still the, the, the surface circulation that you're seeing for some reason. Maybe I hard-coded a number somewhere. 
Um, but you can use these, uh, uh, these tools to look at the two-dimensional problem at different depths. You can also do the three-dimensional problem with the same code and the same notebook by just changing the depth level to the value zero. That's in theory, but I'm not going to try because I've already failed a couple of times. Um, and so this is a package that lets you do three-dimensional as well. And, and you can also find in the documentation of individual displacements of the gel, examples for the atmosphere, um, exactly the same idea. Uh, typically you want higher frequency than a month for the flow fields of the atmosphere because of the storms. Um, but same code, same principle. Uh, uh, it's possible the model taking into account the velocity that sinks, or you're just taking the, uh, the account, the constant levels, uh, the plastic is always on the same level. Yes, very good question. So um, I was just saying you can do 3D, right? So first of all, you can provide three-dimensional flow fields. Right? And in this case, you will let normally um, the particles follow that. So that's the first part of the answer. But the second is you can also change the, um, I guess the advection kernel, meaning that instead of just taking the flow field to move your particles, you can do what you want. With it. So you can add a term that's just sinking, right? Uh, so even in a 2D case, you could do that. You could have a two-dimensional flow field that you integrate over space but you have a sinking term that tells you that at some point you go below a certain depth. And maybe at this point you'd say that that's not in my layer anymore. Um, that's a package that I'm also using for things like simulating the behavior of Argo floats. Uh, so you can have in the, uh, in the, in the, in the advection kernel, um, a term that represents uh, an active control by an operator, right? So you can make the Argo floats for those who have not experience that, uh, uh, buoys that we put in the ocean, they have a certain flotability that we can specify. And so they're going to drift typically at a, at a depth level of say a thousand meters. And every 10 days, they're going to go down to 2000, back to the surface, measure temperature and salinity along the way, stop there and transmit data to the satellite and then cycle like that again. So you can build all of this in and do simulations of, um, of observing system this way. Um, and if you start adding some of the stochastic term and, and, and so on, you hopefully can reproduce kind of a realistic behavior of, um, of the Argo network. All right. Time for lunch? No, one more question. Thanks, Gail. Super interesting. Uh, cool. when, you have, when you run those simulations with Argo flows, uh, I'm guessing you have very different levels of accuracy. Um, no, not necessarily. Um, the fact is that the, the depth at which the floats have been set to drift, this 1,000 meter depth, is a place where the flow field is, in fact, fairly laminar and fairly predictable from climatology. Um, also relatively slow compared to the sea surface. And so that means a bit of an easier problem than, uh, than maybe at the surface. Ooh, is the laptop just? Ah, um, so yeah, but you want, you want to test that for sure. I mean, it's, it's not an easy problem to do it you know, in a very realistic way. Uh, and there are other colleagues that do it better than me at this point on that, actually. What's the accuracy level? I, I don't, honestly, I don't have a number to give you and I have not done this in very recent times either. Uh, um, but we can, we can definitely look into that if you're interested and then set up calculations that we can compare to the real network. Um, in fact, it's a segue a little bit to my, uh, the, the, my contribution to the presentation with Alex this afternoon. I'll, tell, I'll tell you a little more about how to access the real data sets from Argo and from other, other projects that give you the, the real life scenario that you want to test your model against, right? And so this is kind of where I'm going with this, is, is trying to get those two things together and then you know, train some neural networks some estimation methods that might be better, Bayesian, something, um, and sort of get into those questions. Um, 
and, and be able to simulate, hopefully, um, any observing system. Um, another example is, you know, a mooring, right? A mooring is something that's put with an encore to the seafloor. And it has a flotability that basically makes the cable uh, uh, sharp and tense, I guess, uh, so that it doesn't move too much. But nevertheless, the tides are going to move it around, the waves are going to move it around, and so on and so forth. And so you, can, you could use these tools to look at that and try to simulate the way that your mooring behaves just with a different set of equations and advection kernel again. Um, so it's a, it's a very generally applicable framework. The accuracy, typically, you get there once you put a, some amount of work in, in specifying all of the equations as precisely as you can, the stochastic terms as precisely as you can, and so on. Does that address it? Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all for your uh, listening to this, and uh, see you after lunch. Thank <laughs> you.